Welcome. Today we have Rissa Miller. She is an editor, author, herbalist, seer, and storyteller. She specializes in tea leaf reading, tassiography, and smoke reading, capnomancy. Her divination and storytelling expertise stems from extensive research into the area of esoteric history, including ghosts, witchcraft, cryptids, and folklore. Rissa believes the most enduring stories teach us not only about humanity's past, but also give reason to reflect on our own present beliefs and realities. She helps cast light into the shadows and often leads ghost tours. Welcome, Rissa. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Yes, I'm very excited to have you here today. And today is going to be a very special episode because we are going to do a dream session. So you have been so kind to submit to me your dream. First, I am going to read it from beginning to end, and then we will dive in. That sounds great. I can't wait. Okay, awesome. Well, the first thing that I asked you to do was give your dream a title. And the dream that you chose is Large Lizards. So that's where we're going to set the stage. We're going to start at the beginning and go from there. So at the start, I have a small aquarium with two tiny lizards. They are not doing well. In fact, they look like the two anoles I had as pets back in my late teens. Both died years ago. One of the pair gets his tail injured somehow, and I assume it's going to die. So I move it to a second aquarium to have peace in passing. But it does not die. It regenerates and grows larger and stronger. It seems to double in size, and it has a new tail. In the meantime, the other lizard has suddenly become aquatic. It's trying to live in its water dish. So I change its aquarium to have more water with only a little land. Then the second one begins to grow. Over the dream, it seems like days are passing and the two lizards are both growing and transforming. They become huge and into a new breed. I have looked and there's nothing like them in real life. They are not docile. They seem to know they rely on me for food. They both need new, larger aquariums. And then they outgrow them, and I transform a room into a habitat for them. They are now about five feet long and weigh more than me. They are demanding and now colorful, with varying shades of green and purple on one and shades of green and blue on the other. They're becoming too much to care for. I am also dog-sitting a small white dog in the dream. She's a real dog I know, and she is scared of the lizards, even go near their room. I start to worry they could eat her. I try to find a wildlife center to take them or reptile rescue. No one has room for such larger beasts. No one will take them. Or help me. Now they are eating whole rats. They are ravenous all the time. As they keep getting bigger, I wonder if they would eat me. I try to keep the small white dog far from them. I keep thinking they are monsters. What can I do with them? It never occurs to me to kill them. In some way, I feel I made them and am responsible for this bizarre fast growth and change, yet I am overwhelmed by their care and getting scared. One lizard shed a skin that then became a small snake. I'm not scared of snakes, to be clear, or reptiles in general, but it doesn't make sense to have a lizard shed a snake. I know it's not an unusual thing, but again, no one seems to want to take it or adopt it. Another creature to feed for me. Somehow, they are starting to actually sap the electrical power from my house in the dream, like they are now absorbing power itself. I wonder what the three are up to and how long I will be useful. or if. I am the next meal. 
just before I woke up, I had actually grown scared of them. And the snake was starting to telepathically speak to me. I cannot recall what it said, but at that moment, I recall telling myself it was a dream and it was time to wake up. It was exactly 3 a.m. when I awoke. Such an excellent dream record, first off. I just love this. And I also love that it ends with lucidity. How amazing. So I actually, I've always, since I was a teenager, I've had dream journals on and off. So I'm very familiar with the process of recording dreams. And a therapist helped me understand lucidity in dreams a long time ago. I was troubled for years with really violent nightmares. And I think it's how I process stress for a long time. And I learned to speak to myself in my dreams to wake up. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yes. <laughs> Lucidity can be such a therapeutic technique for people that suffer from nightmares specifically. Because not only can you recognize that you're dreaming and manipulate that scenario or escape it, but you can also change the trajectory of that dream to one that is much more beneficial to you. And that can be so therapeutic as well. Yeah. So you said that you were feeling good and had just delivered a great talk about your art and your creative work. And you had gone right to sleep. But when you woke up at three o'clock, you were feeling nervous, frightened, and in a cold sweat. And it wasn't because of the temperature of the room. So really strong emotional response to the dream story. So what I, where I want to start is the different scenes that take place in the dream story. Because I like that at first it's in a small aquarium. And then there's a second aquarium. And then there is a new larger aquarium. And then you transform a room into a habitat for them. And then you start looking for a wildlife center. So that trajectory of the accommodation of the landscape to the growth, I think, is really fascinating. Now, if you were to describe the purpose of an aquarium to someone that didn't know what it was or what its purpose was, what would you say? I would say an aquarium is a safe home for an animal that needs that kind of habitat. I mean, certainly lizards are the only things that we keep in aquariums. Sometimes, you know, fish obviously they need water or small rodents things like crabs little little hermit crabs they all live in aquariums good and when you were a teenager you had to tell me what anoles are they're those little itty bitty tiny lizards that are about this long people call them chameleons but they're not chameleons are a little bigger and chameleons also have the eyes that can turn all directions right and gnolls are just very small little reptiles. Back when I was in high school, you, you could buy them, which was like 30 years ago. You could buy them for like $2 at a pet store. And I had two. They lived a really long time. And I, I think I had already left for college when they finally passed because they, they were bizarrely old at that point. Okay. And do you have any or have you had any in your adult life after that no okay I, I pet set for some but i haven't had any of my own okay so i think it's important that the dream places you in a time in your life a very specific age and time in your life so it references something that did exist in your life at a specific time so and actually the first mm -hmm. room in the dream is my high school bedroom uh, even more so. Yes. 
Yes. And as the aquariums get bigger, it's different rooms that they go yeah. in. Yes. The origination of the emotion and the underlying emotional themes are going to find their origin in high school. Okay. That because that's where it's placing you. Yeah. And even though you are changing the the scene and the, the scene is changing to accommodate and you're trying to accommodate the growth and the expansion, it does originate there. So that's where we're going to kind of focus in on, you know, when we look back, when we get to the mirror stage, after we decode all the different little parts that are presented, then we're going to look at that theme and that story as a mirror for that time period being the origination. So we go from all those different rooms. And first, we have the tail being injured. And what I find so interesting about this part is that you say you believe it's going to die. And so you move it to let it have peace in passing. So when its tail is injured, does that normally mean that it is going to die? Or did you just intuit that you needed to do that because you saw that it was injured? I don't know if that particular breed of lizard in, in real life and science regenerates. Some do. I don't know if that one does or not. Mm -hmm. And I guess in the dream, I thought not. And mm -hmm. in the dream, the aquarium was full of a fresh batch of crickets mm. and they were really lively and hopping around. And this is just what you feed in all. This is a normal part of the process. And I didn't want the crickets to annoy the lizard if he was going to pass. I wanted mm -hmm. it to have a peaceful passing without the crickets hopping around energetically because mm -hmm. I know the energy of death and the energy of crickets hopping around is very different. Right. And so I wanted it to simply have the quiet to to pass if it want if it was going to because mm -hmm. i remember when i was having the dream i was like oh he's not gonna make it and i thought i i need to put him somewhere where he can have the solitude to just go to sleep and die and that's not mm -hmm. what happened mm -hmm. i guess the solitude was the rest and recovery that he needed so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so the I think it's very interesting that you feel that it's not going to make it and then it surprises you and it wow. regenerates and it grows larger and stronger and doubles in size. And then there's a new tail. Now, the other one becomes aquatic and is trying to live in its water dish. Now, you shared something with me just before we started recording that was very indicative of this scene. Go ahead and tell the yeah. listeners what that was. So I was on Facebook earlier today and a friend had shared with me a picture of an actual lizard in a bathtub. She just sent this picture. She said, ah, oh, this was funny. I thought you'd like it. And I went, well, there's a coincidence that doesn't feel coincidental. Right. And there are no coincidences. And you had submitted this dream to me quite some time yes. ago. This dream is and from a, quite a number of weeks back. And there the lizard was in the bathtub today. Right. Today, the day that we're recording this. Mm -hmm. So. The lizard becoming aquatic and you changing its aquarium to have more water. Now, one of the ways that we can look at elements in the dream, when we look at the presence of earth, air, fire, and water, many times water can represent emotions. Right. Consider that the two lizards are aspects of yourself. And that part of you, you believe, isn't going to make it. And you're going to let it pass. And the other part is in the emotions, is in the water dish, is trying to live in there. And so is very much becoming, becoming aquatic is an interesting action. Because it's not like, I actually did an interpretation last night for someone who saw someone floating face down in a pool. Well, that's different from becoming aquatic. Very different. And so you're actually adapting 
to your environment. And if your environment is your emotions, that means that you're actually adapting to the emotional challenges and you're persevering, you're regenerating, you're actually so accommodating for those changes and those trajectories by putting more water, having to be less land, moving into another aquarium, and then ultimately transforming a room into a habitat because they become, they do so well and they become so big that they become a new breed, which is so interesting. Because consider what, if you had no fear to become your true self and your authentic self, what would that become? I never looked at it that way. That's kind of amazing. <laughs> yes, yes. The new breed. It's like, okay. And so they outgrow the aquarium. They, you transform a room for them. They become bigger than you. And I love that too, because it's like the feeding of an aspect of yourself. Now, what is questionable is what is it that you're feeding? Because I was thinking becomes, about that listening to you. Yes, because then it becomes fearful, overwhelming, full of anxiety, full of responsibility, right? And so, but, but at this stage, it's like, oh, you know, I'm actually reinvigorating life into these two. I'm giving them a way that they can both survive in their own accommodations and they're actually thriving so much that they become very colorful, which it sounds like maybe they weren't at the oh, beginning. They were plain, like tan colored. Mm hmm. Right. And so then they take on this very colorful existence, which, you know, there's some color theory that we're going to get to in a moment, but that's where the color really comes in for them when you describe once they become that big. But then at that point, they're becoming too much to care for and then enters the white dog. And so this is, first off, a dog that you are dog sitting. It's not yours, but it's one that you know. Now, is this one that you dog sit in real life? Yes. Okay. Now, tell me about the owner. If you were um, to describe that person in three adjectives, how would you describe that person? In general or in regards to the dog? Okay, in regards to the dog. Protective. So many times when people appear in the dream, we want to look at what they represent. Now, in this case, the dog obviously represents something by itself, but because it is a transactional relationship that you have with someone where you're pet sitting for them and, and you do that in real life and you're also doing that in the dream, that person does play a role an indirect role. Also, the dog represents likely another aspect of yourself, one that you are trying to protect. And even though it is a dog that you know in real life, it could show up and be a different color. But it, in this case, it's white dog. When you are taking care of that dog, you're very much concerned for its safety. Responsibility starts doubling because you're concerned for the lizards that you feel responsible for having accentuated their rapid growth. And you also contrarily feel responsible for the dog who you are concerned about its safety. And so there's overwhelm on both sides. There's fear on both sides, and there's a lot of anxiety about responsibility. And then we have the snake. So one of the lizards sheds a snake. Is it the aquatic one? No, it's, it, I must say, it's the one that likes it hot and dry. 
Okay. It is important. And a, a snake is very much a, a topic that comes up so much when I talk with people about dreams because I always talk about how I don't really feel that people should use dream dictionaries. And snakes are something that a lot of people might look up in a dream dictionary and say, well, I dreamt about a snake. What does it mean? And a lot of times dream interpreters will say, well, it's always this. It always means this. And leave it at that. But I feel that your personal associations with everything in your dream are the keys. And so for you, you're not scared of snakes. So this is a perfect example of why those standard definitions don't apply because you're not scared of them. And so it's not a bad omen in, or whatever. It's, you may have a lot of fear in the dream, but it's not because of the snake. So I, the snake is almost, it, it feels, it, of all the things in the dream, I feel most intuitively connected to the snake. Hmm. You say that the snake starts to telepathically speak to you and you can't remember what it says, but you're also just not sure in general about the three of them, the two lizards and the snake, what is going to become of you. Right. Now, the you is actually also just an aspect of you. So when you worry, what will become of me? Will I be consumed by this? Will I be eaten? Will I lose myself in this? Will I become overwhelmed by this and essentially dissolved? Is the aspect of your ego perhaps countering the other pure soul sides of you? that have grown so much and evolved and are intuitively connected. And so there's that fear of death and that fear of dissolution, but there's also that symbolism of the regeneration and of creation, because from the two comes the third. Right. I'm essentially. The other part mm -hmm. that I, as you're talking, I'm remembering, I wasn't just afraid that they were going to eat me and the dog. I was afraid that they were becoming so highly evolved and intelligent that they would simply not need me and open the door and leave, you know? And I didn't know what would become of them out in the world. I was almost sure somebody would do something horrible to them because I still wanted them to exist, which is just why I was looking for a sanctuary or a a rescue or someone else to take them who knew more about their needs. Your desire to pass off the responsibility for them, but also feeling like you can't destroy them because they're intrinsically fueled by you. They're part of you. That's why you don't think to destroy them because you realize that they are part of you. But at the same time, you are conflicted about like the ownership of those aspects and looking to kind of pass that off to someone else to either take the lead on acknowledging that aspect or the responsibility of embodying that aspect. And what I like about the fact that there are three at the end and also that you wake up at three, there's a lot of numerical significance around the number three, which we'll get to. Too. So the aquatic lizard is trying to live and thrive in the water. And we know that water can be a metaphor for emotions. And so they both grow and transform and become a new breed. But they rely on you for food. And they become very demanding and ravenous and keep outgrowing their surroundings and and you keep transforming the, the habitats to try and accommodate those transformations but it's not enough and so when you look at that as a mirror for your life trajectory where you're growing and expanding and you're outgrowing your surroundings and you're trying to 
find surroundings that can accommodate your personal growth and that you're out, outgrowing even yourself, even your preconceived conception about yourself. And the aquarium represents safety. So we can see how that as an object in the story plays quite a role. So then we have the dog. And when that other animal enters, there is overwhelm, fear, responsibility, power sucking, and questions around purposefulness, sustenance. Am I going to be able to sustain this? Am I going to still be of purpose? How long will I be useful? Was really one of those existential questions. And then we have the emotions of demanding too much to care for. No one will help. Fear of being consumed. Responsible for fast change, quote unquote, bizarre growth. Overwhelmed, scared, out of control, growth and change. And then we have sapping of the power, absorbing of the power itself. And that nervousness and frightened, that fear of will I be, a, will I be absorbed by this? Will I lose control if I continue with this change that is so fast that it's almost bizarre and where will I lose will, will a part of me that I'm trying to protect be destroyed if I allow this growth now initially you are concerned that they are not doing well but when you change the habitat and you feed them and, and where they outgrow their surroundings they start to thrive beyond your comprehension so it's beyond what you thought was possible. But then existentially, there's concern around losing control over that growth, being consumed by it, losing your ability to keep up with the demand and being no longer useful. Also, it's interesting that the white dog is a she. Now, I realize that it's a she in real life, but the fact that it is also a she, because you could say, well, it's the dog I sat, but it was, but it was, I knew it was that dog, but it was brown and it was, it was a boy dog. It's not. In this case, it's a she. She is also an aspect of yourself. You are subconsciously protecting. She's scared of the lizards. She, the dreamer, is also scared of the lizards. So both of you together are scared of the lizards. And that is the other reason why you're, you're tied with the dog, because you're both scared of the lizards. And the lizards really represent the control and the aspects that you're trying to create. We talked about what fear are you feeding and what are you afraid to let go of control of? The question for me would be, if you could change this scenario, what would be a more positive outcome? with the lizards then we could just be peaceful together okay regardless of how large they got yeah. and yeah. that you would be able to accommodate them yeah and be able to take care of them regardless of how expansively bizarrely they continued to grow exactly okay good so what I like to incorporate is color theory, and I want to look at the green and the purple and the blue of each of those. So what is the scene? It's an aquarium. And what does an aquarium represent to you? A safe space. There's a lot of concern around the change of the uh, lizards, the growth of the lizards, the fact that you might not be able to control what they might do, how you feel like you're not in control of their growth or their safety or the dog's safety or your own safety. So that's 
the undercurrent for the green. Now, the blue, of course, is very much the aspect of the aquatic. You expressed intuitive telepathic connection with the snake. If you do try to provide to the one lizard, give him that chance to rest, to be peaceful. Two aspects of the lizard are two aspects of yourself that have their origins in your teenage days because you're placed in the high school room to start. Fueled those aspects of yourself as you moved your habitat, as you expanded your surroundings, but yet still seeking that safety in order to have that peace and to grow. And that eventually you allowed it to grow to such an extent that it was much larger than you ever thought it would be. And so when you had gone to sleep, you had just had a very positive experience presenting your art and your creative work. And so you thought, well, I'm feeling great about this. And then you went to sleep and you had this dream and disconcerting at first to say, what is my conflict? But there is still a little aspect of yourself perhaps the white dog, that is concerned about protecting its integrity, right? And protecting its, the aspect of itself and is worried about possibly losing itself, being consumed by these other aspects that are continuing to grow. In fact, they're transforming into a new breed, into another animal, which you are then intuitively connected with that third aspect. And so when we look at the number three, numerologically, three can really symbolize growth. And of course, many times it is the combination of two things. Two humans making a a baby is a great example of that, but there are so many other metaphysical aspects of three representations of three. It can be your creations, your spiritual power, your abundance, the three, the third aspect. The angel number three is about performance and expression. And Tesla said that the three, six, and nine hold the key to the universe. And of course, he was very much in, enthralled with electricity and the ability to manifest using the number three. And what happens when we get to the point where the lizard sheds the snake, they're tapping into the electrical current of your house, which is you, your electrical spiritual nature, your power, your electricity, and you're concerned about it sapping your power. But in fact, you realize that you have a telepathic, intuitive connection to it. So you are feeding the lizards, you are powering them but you are concerned that they are sapping your power. And so there's this acknowledgement of power that needs to take place where you actually are stepping into yours and realizing that you can fuel them and yourself, those aspects of yourself, without feeling like you're losing your power. You know, one of the things that keeps sort of entering my mind is that as I am going along and working on my business, this is so ironic, but one of the challenges I've hit is fear of success and fear of growth. And that each time I hit a milestone, when I was in high school, honestly, I loved those milestones. I strove for them and I stretched and was super excited to get them. But somewhere along the line... I don't know what happened, but life, various aspects of life, I did change. And I was not as confident, maybe. 
And now as I have gone through another transition in life and changed again, a new habitat, a new life, a new work situation, there's definitely been fear about each time there's new growth. It happens. And I have definitely been digesting it and trying to actually, even in the time when the stream was happening, it was me thinking, all right, what's next? I know that next year there has to be some, literally thinking about there has to be something big. I need to make something big, a big change. I don't, and I, I'm thinking about different, actually two main different things. Am I going to write a book or am I going to start doing online classes? But it, it's the two. And I'm still chewing on that even right now. But as you're talking, I was like, is this it? Is this me thinking about that? And, you know, interestingly enough, when I was in high school and I had my lizards, my real life lizards, I went to school to be a writer. I went to NYU to be a screenwriter. And that's not what I ended up doing in my life. Although writing is a skill you take with you into everything. So, I mean, it, I worked as a writer at newspapers and in many other applications. So it wasn't a wasted education. I just didn't happen to write movies. So, yeah. I just did a lot of rambling. Does this make sense? No, it's great. I mean, this is the metaphor stage where we're looking at the dream as a metaphor for your life. And you're seeing how it's all coming together. You're seeing how it is a metaphor for the trajectory that you've taken and that you are at a crossroads deciding what that next step is and what aspects you're going to revive of yourself and what aspects you're going to give a peaceful passage to and just the different stages that you've gone through and how your surroundings and your life trajectory has changed as, as so many people do, those changes that we go through. So it's fabulous to, to get that feedback. Interestingly, that um, particular dog that I watch, the dog herself is one of those types of dogs that's super barky and scared of everyone. And I, I mean, she's super sweet. Once you know her, she's lovely and cuddly, but initially very apprehensive mm -hmm. and standoffish, shy. Now, nobody would ever be intimidated. She weighs nothing and she's a tiny, fluffy white dog. But I, one of her trademarks would probably be initial fear. Yes. So it is important to, to know the aspects of the dog as well. Yes. As I was thinking about the dog more when you were talking, I thought she's afraid of anything new. Okay. Even even a new place, she doesn't want to get out of the car. Even uh, a new food, she literally walks up to the dish short and sideways like, uh, sure. Okay. Okay. So that's definitely what she represents. It's not just your fear for her. It's that she represents that apprehension, that resistance to change. Yeah. And even and, yeah. positive change. Look, I've upgraded you. You've got fancy traits. She's like, mm -hmm. think about it. Mm -hmm. even if so we have the, the snake that is really important. Embracing that change and connecting with you and speaking to you that inner wisdom. And then we have the dog that is kind of diametrically opposed to that going, oh, I don't know. No, this isn't good. I might get eaten. I don't want to proceed with any change. And so those are kind of the, the opposing forces. Right? Yeah. And, you know, even as I've been thinking about the dream, in the dream, I remember thinking the lizards are really beautiful, but I can't take care of them. I can't provide them with the resources they need. I remember thinking, what would happen to them if something happened to me? Like, they're so big. And the other thing is they were secrets. Nobody knew I had lizards at all. No, they were my lizards that took up the whole room. I knew that I wasn't telling anybody about them. People knew that I watched dogs. I've been pest hunter since I was 20. I love it. I mean, it's not just a side hustle. I just love doing it. Mm -hmm. That said, nobody knew I had these two lizards, even when they were small. They were just like little friends that sat next to me at my desk. And as they kept getting bigger, I was like, whoa, none of my friends know about this. My family doesn't know about this. If something happens to me, then 
Somebody's not getting my house and find these lizards that are bigger than people. And- hmm. So I love that you brought that up because it's something that you're keeping secret about yourself and that you're afraid of people finding out. I feel like they're pretty open about the things they do. But yeah, yeah, I guess everyone has, or at least most people have, a a fear of judgment of their true self. Mm -hmm. And as I've been on this path doing my history work and my divination work Mm -hmm. and the spiritual path, I've received judgment, negative judgment, as well as lots of positive judgment and support. But I've definitely felt a change in the circle of people around me. Mm -hmm. And I always want to believe that when you're authentic, people will embrace it. But that's not always true. It's by stepping into that authenticity that we get into alignment. And when we get into alignment, then those that are not in alignment with us doesn't mean we're going to align with everybody, right? Right. And so then it's like those that do not align with us fall away, go to their peaceful place, hopefully, And you are then able to surround yourself more and feed your inner purpose and guidance and creativity in that safe and secure place. And that ultimately is what leads you to abundance. Because when you take that quantum leap of faith and you feed those inner secret parts of yourself, then the universe readjusts its habitat right to then support you in doing that and that's where that abundance comes from is by really being authentically in alignment with your creative gifts yeah i i love that and that resonates a lot it's one of my daily morning meditations when i'm asking my guides my ancestors Each day I say, help me focus on the gifts and talents you've given me and bring them into the earthly space in the way that I'm destined to. Yes. And then I say, also, support me through this endeavor. Absolutely. That's a beautiful practice. And But it it sounds like exactly what you're saying. Yes, it does. (laughs) So now I'm going to pull you an oracle card to wrap wrap it up and see what we have there all right okay it is far away places and the message at the bottom is get ready for new horizons so it really is your call to continue to feed those beasts without fear And allow them to no longer be a secret because your next venture is a new horizon and is really going to lead you towards that next phase where you are continuing to not only feed those aspects of yourself, but not worry about losing your other self, your ego self in doing that and finding that alignment and safety and security and that authenticity and holding the power embracing your telepathic power your intuitive power and not feeling that you're going to lose your power that your power is going to be sapped really embodying that power so that you can move forward in all of your creative endeavors That's beautifully said. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the interpretation. The Oracle card resonates perfectly. And yeah, just lots of gratitude. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate you sharing your dream with everyone and just uh, being a guest. I also really love what you do. And I think it's fabulous and so unique. And so I really support you in in all your future endeavors. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. Subscribe to my podcast now to ensure you never miss an episode filled with insights and wisdom.
hit that subscribe button and be part of our growing community. Are you ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey? Don't miss out on the Women's Dream Empowerment Program, a unique opportunity for you to connect with your intuition, unlock your inner wisdom, and align with your higher self through dream work, personalized meditations, and healing sound frequencies. Finally, I want to hear from you. If you enjoyed this episode, please reach out. If you'd like your dream or awakening story featured on my show, submit it today. Your dreams have the power to inspire and enlighten other women on their journey. Visit womensdreamanalysis.com to find out more.